report on computer. All right, and we're off. So, um, yeah, so we, we're doing this interview because we, me and Eddie started this, this journal that I think the goal of it is to be able to bring to working class people a socialist narrative in a way that's non-alienating as, as some of the other leftist platforms um, are. So part of that is being able to both grab elements from academia, uh, Marxist philosophy, uh, politics, and also have uh, elements that um, can give a concise example of, of what the working class experience is like, and specifically um, industrial work. And since we're based in, in the Midwest, uh, we, we called this whole shebang Midwest Marx. So we figured uh, as, as you're known in the labor club circles as the, the embodiment of the proletariat, um, that you'd be a perfect subject for, for an interview on, on what being an industrial worker is like, uh, what being a part of a union is like in the Midwest. Um, so yeah, do you, would you like to give yourself an, 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 a short introduction of, of who you are and, and kind of what you do? Sure. Um, so my name's Stephen Meyer, uh, Stephen Louis Meyer. Um, would have been November of 2018, I hired into John Deere, uh, which means I'm a member of the United Auto Workers Union, uh, which was founded in 1935. Uh, John Deere is mainly an uh, agricultural um, plant, um, but they do make uh, construction and forestry equipment as well. Um, so John Deere Dubuque uh, would be a little bit of both, a little bit of construction and forestry and a little bit of agricultural. So I worked, um, when I first started there, I was in production driving a fork truck uh, in the backhoe department. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I was uh, working on skid steers, um, which backhoe and skid steer would both be considered construction equipment. Um, and they're also two of John Deere's biggest sellers, uh, customers in Russia, you know, global, Brazil, all over the place. Um, wasn't my first union. My first union was actually the Campaign Workers Guild. Um, so that experience, uh, being a campaign worker, organizing um, ourselves into a union, um, because at the time we weren't getting paid $15 an hour while the candidate that I was working for was talking about a $15 minimum wage. <laughs> so we unionized ourselves, uh, ended up getting uh, compensated fairly well compared to other state-run campaigns in the state at that time. Um, so chalk that up as a success for the working class, um, not only for ourselves, um, but for kind of just the whole movement of you know, not just saying fight for 15, but actually fighting for it in a real meaningful way. So that was where I got started with, uh, I guess you could say, uh, my infatuation with wanting to be in a union or around union organizing in some capacity. Um, I had a cousin who for years was telling me to apply at John Deere. I never thought that I would get hired because I lacked the quote unquote experience. Um, but turns out that uh, pretty much any job where you punch the clock is just like any other job where you punch the clock. Um, so that's where the union kind of comes in. Uh, you know, once you're in there, uh, even if you lack experience, it's pretty hard for them to fire you. So you're you're awarded the opportunity to fail a few times um, before that boss just comes, grabs you, snatches you, and throws you out of the building. Um, so, I mean, just starting right there, um, walking in the door at John Deere, uh, nervous that I didn't have any experience, quote unquote, um, it was very comforting knowing that, you know, there was some guidelines that I had to be followed. Um, that I could familiarize myself with. And it wasn't just some company memo that didn't really mean anything. It was actually you know, a binding uh, contract. Um, so, I mean, ju just that uh, stress off of your, of your plate as an individual um, meant a lot to me. Um, so in return, you know, you gotta, you gotta do uh, 
you know, what, what you got to do as a union brother or sister or friend. Um, so I started going to the meetings and been doing that kind of stuff, you know, um, started the labor for Bernie in Dubuque, um, organized around same, same kind of issues, um, spoke about labor, uh, at, uh, one of Bernie's rallies here in town in front of like 700 people. Um, so, uh, I mean, John Deere in the in the Midwest. I mean, it, it. I mean, I'm sure you guys know, and I'm sure anybody watching this knows John Deere is a big deal. You know, they're they're a, a brand like no other. Um, so, from kind of a outward view of working at John Deere in the Midwest, it does come with some sort of status, I suppose. Um, but that isn't really how I look at it. I didn't get a job there because I wanted to tell people I worked at John Deere. I got a job there because I knew the UAW was there and I knew that uh, moving forward uh, at my age being almost 40 when I got hired there, I couldn't take another job where my security was left up to if some supervisor decides whether or not they're going to like me because of my age, my sex, my race, whatever the case may be, um, you know, that's, so yeah, go that's, ahead. That's one of the, one of the things that me and Eddie have been focusing on as for the site, um, that relationship between what's considered industrial or agricultural labor, um, labor that's directly related to, to the process of, of production and the labor that comes after, like like service jobs and stuff like that. Um, would you mind speaking a little bit since you've been sort of in, in both um, in both uh, uh, classes in, within the working masses, um, what you see as the main difference between between being in an industrial or agricultural job and and um, and being in a service uh, job? I mean. <laughs> really there isn't much of a difference. So, I mean, you know, I worked as a, as a line cook for years and years. It's the same concept as working on an assembly line. You need to be able to communicate with the guy next to you. Everything that you're doing is dependent on what they're doing and vice versa. Um, safety becomes an issue, not just for yourself, but for the guy standing next to you who, you know, standing above a 165 degree, uh, fryer you know you don't want to be screwing up because he could get hurt so it's just same on assembly line you you're not just looking out for yourself it becomes a, a team issue um the the separation being is you know in the industrial world i mean the chances of you dying is a little bit higher than it is say in the service industry so there's a hazard um you know factor um, but in terms of the camaraderie that needs to be built amongst the folks that are working those jobs, it's, it's the same. Um, you know, the, the pay is obviously different, but again, uh, you know, that, that really has no bearing on, on what you have to do as a, as a working class individual in those situations to make sure that you're not only protecting yourself, but your coworker. And nine times out of 10, the, the boss is kind of in the way of that process really being the way it should be. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, um, I think Eddie, Eddie would agree as well that um, one, of the, one of the focus that we really wanted to emphasize is uh, that we, we feel like is missing on the left is, is the focus of uh, industrial and, and productive labor as as a tremendous source of power that is absolutely necessary in the building of socialism. I think with, uh, with some of the influences that uh, the US left has had from the new left elements, which no longer really seeks uh, that traditional working class um, uh, as an agent of, of revolution, the, the focus has been mainly on other sectors of the working masses. So, I think our project is not necessarily a rejection of that other part in so, in so much as, as just a, a focus of bringing to light on the immense power that's in industrial labor and in agricultural labor. And I think you're right to say that essentially the relationships between people, the camaraderie 
um, the solidarity uh, be between workers, regardless of uh, the workplace they're in, is essentially always going to be there. But one of the elements that we like to examine is how the relations of power manifest themselves in the different sections of, of the working masses. So in terms of, of power and, and what can bring a, a, a substantial shock to the economy, um, what differences do you see when, when you were in, in, in a service job or uh, when you were in a plant in, 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 or when, you, when you're in a plant in, in John Deere? Um, like essentially, like if, if, there was, if a strike were to happen within service jobs and if a strike were to happen within John Deere, a general strike, um, where would you see um, the most influence um, taking place? Well, I mean, John Deere, at least here in Dubuque, if they went on strike, that's essentially, I mean, I, I can't put a number on it, you know, but I'm sure it's a pretty large percentage of the, you know, consumer spending power that would be missing from the, from the economy. Um, whereas if the four or five Burger Kings or McDonald's, what have you, if they went on strike, there's not going to be any real dip at all. So just that, uh, you know, that buying power that comes from John Deere, um, that could have a massive effect if, uh, you know, there was ever such a thing as a wildcat strike uh, in Iowa um, and it came from John Deere, that, that would be a huge thing. Uh, but uh, you know, I don't know how sustainable it would really be either because at the same point in time, um, which I think you guys were going to ask me about later was what I would like to see unions change. And it's a good, good time to bring that up is, you know, if I, if we went on strike, we're only getting a couple hundred dollars a week. So it's about, it's about like what's going on with this, this pandemic right now, folks are going to lose that $600 bonus and they're going to be getting a couple hundred dollars a week. It's kind of hard to focus on, uh, you know, the dictatorship of the proletariat when you are trying to figure out where that next meal is going to come from. So you can't really be out on the picket lines, uh, you know, when, when you got a family to feed. So I think that's where the unions really need to start making some, some changes. They do everything from uh, what happens if the company comes after us standpoint. Um, instead of uh, let, let's look after our, our membership first and then worry about what happens if the company comes after us. So they all have these huge legal funds, um, strike funds, what have you, but they're, they're just very reluctant, reluctant to ever really dip in there and make some real impactful, you know, the, the auto workers could have went on strike for a year if their unions would have just paid them but instead they made a ton of unnecessary concessions because they had to get back to work. So I, I you know, that, that's my, my want and my need uh, for the UAW is to step up and be that union because that's where we, we started. You know, we, we, we quote unquote built the middle class. I think it's time for the UAW to rebuild the middle class. Uh, and it's not going to happen if we're, uh, you know, too worried about that $800 million strike fund and, and, and not actually dipping into it and, and using it what, for what it was intended for. And that's to hold power. Absolutely. Um, Eddie, on that note, do you have any questions? Um, I don't know. I just, I think that's uh, really good what you said, because when, when Act 10 was happening in Wisconsin and they were looking to take away teachers collective bargaining rights. Some of the, the teachers went on strike, which like we said, doesn't have a huge effect, but, uh, but also some of the manufacturing unions and stuff in Wisconsin went on strike in solidarity. But like you said, it just wasn't sustainable um, because people had to get back to work to feed their families. So they weren't able to get, they weren't able to get anything, honestly. So. That's probably the reason why they're so hesitant to continue giving the unemployment bonus is because they want people off the streets right now. And they can't seem to do it by beating them, so they're going to try starving them to death. Right. Absolutely. As far as uh, the actual physical um, workplace, 
Um, what are some, some changes in your sort of everyday uh, routine um, at work that you would like to, to see? And connected to that, um, how can the changes you think that the union itself ha uh, should make help in acquiring those, um, those goals of, of changes within the actual workplace? Um, well, so that it's going to be a little bit of a long answer. So I don't want to necessarily throw John Deere in particular under the bus. So I'm just going to make a, a more broad statement on, on industrial uh, work in general. Um, so there's a lot of fossil fuels that get burnt in those buildings. Uh, for example, um, not every building has fork trucks that are electric. A lot of them still run on natural gases. So, I mean, there's just one simple thing right there that you have 1,400 people inside of a building all day long with um, a lot of fork trucks driving around. It doesn't just happen at John Deere. It happens at Caterpillar or wherever else. So um, I'm not trying to throw John Deere under the bus by any stretch. Uh, the only way those things can change, though, is if we make major reforms to uh, how we look at bargaining. And right now, our bargaining power rests in wages and in healthcare. Um, and, it, you know, there was a time when working conditions were really at the forefront of, of most negotiations. You know, we, you establish a, a wage across the industry and eventually then you're, you're negotiating working conditions. Um, but that, that hasn't happened for a long time. Um, there's a lot of buildings um, that I'm aware of across the country um, that are in need of massive overhauls to get up with the times. Um, again, burning a lot of fossil fuels when uh, alternative uh, energy options are available. Um, so I, I think, you know, these things all kind of come hand in hand. The union needs to do a better job of protecting workers in terms of um, where they're spending their dollars uh, politically, and they also need to protect them better in where they use their bargaining power with, with the companies that you know, they represent or however you want to look at it. Absolutely. Eddie, do you have any questions on that? Um, not really. I think um, uh, the probably the last question that um, we would ask just to not have it be too long because um, we have to like make it into a transcript and stuff, but um, would be uh, one that's, that's more so the relationship of, of basically um, us and, and yourself, like what do you see the, the relationship being or the, the role that academia can play within, within the struggles of, of the working class? One of the, one of the things that, um, that is uh, a, a focus of, to me and Eddie is how in other revolutionary movements, one of the uh, most common, common things are that uh, radical circles of academia and the intelligentsia are working within working class people. Um, and in, in Latin America, that's the case. A lot of the Marxist scholars from there that I follow, they're militants and they're within working class circles. But it seems to be that here in, in, in the US or more broadly in the West, um, radical academics are in one circle and then three miles away from them uh, are, are workers. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, a yin and yang situation where each one has a void of the other and they both really, I, I think they need to click in order for there to be some sort of uh, revolutionary movement in the United States. So what would you see the role of, of academia in, in the working class struggle as, and how can that relationship in your opinion be mended where, where radical academics and radical politics can, can work with um, uh, labor in the U.S. Uh, well, I mean, so there, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, so I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Um, I, 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 organizing, it, I mean, has to be the, the answer there. And I'm not really sure how you blend um, 
academics and traditional union organizers. Um, but I know a couple guys that do it fairly well and their, their approach, um, seems to be based more in a reality of what goes on um, strictly in terms of working class issues and doesn't stray too far into you know talking about uh, dialectics and things of that nature um, so really just staying at home with hey your boss uh, does a b c or d and it's related to capital and uh, simple easy to understand fashion and this is what you can do as a worker in a real simple uh, without having to n have read all eight volumes of capital or seven or however many there is just being able to relay it um, but that's hard for any organizer to do um, you know even if you're talking to somebody about like medicare for all you will find yourself wanting to get into the wonkiness of things. And that's really the turnoff to people because they, they do have a genuine concern for these things, but when they feel like you're approaching them, like they don't know what's going on in their life, uh, that's the, that's a major turnoff. So, I mean, in terms of, you know, just making it real simple, I think if, if academics want to continue to, to, to organize in these spaces, they need to leave the books at home, uh, roll up their sleeves and really try to get a sense of like what it means to be out in the field picking strawberries for less than minimum wage and it's 100 degrees outside, you know, wrap, wrap, wrap their heads around that a little bit more and, and worry a little bit less about being perfect in the nuances of the ideology that they are trying to adhere to. To be, but, uh, I mean, I, I'm guilty of that myself, and I'm in yeah. the in the working class, you know. So I have to remind myself when I'm speaking with my coworkers that they don't all fully understand capital and its relationship to what you know we do in our day to day lives. They don't they don't always see the connection where to me it's glaringly obvious. Those contradictions sometimes don't land um, as as bluntly on you know people because of american exceptionalism this idea that if you're in a factory and you're working 10 hours a day you're some sort of uh, man or you know stronger individual so a lot of times they're, they're they got a, a large wall built up to some of this stuff so you just got to be able to find that way to get in there and, and really you know show that you are you know standing right next to them in solidarity absolutely and i think um to be completely just paradoxical in, in a conversation that we're talking about having to get away from the books. I think Hegel would provide, provide a, a perfect example of this because the, the thing is that um, uh, traditionally we see like uh, the material world as what's concrete and the ideas as abstract and Hegel's formula flips that and says that actually the ideas is it's, it's what's concrete and, and what's material is really just an abstraction of the idea. And it seems to be that academics um, uh, in being in this field of what is considered abstract are really doing the easiest stuff. They're in the concrete. And what they really have to do is flip it, inverse it again, negate it, and, and really be in the field in what's considered concrete. But to like a Hegelian would be the abstract, which is the, the concrete reality. Really go to the fields and pick and understand what, um, what that lifestyle is like in order for them to maybe after be able to, to provide the work that's necessary to blend the, the relationship between radical politics and, and academia and, and the working class. Um, well, I, I mean, you, 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 you can't uh, just dismiss the resentment that's been built up over decades and decades and decades of, you know, class war in this country. So when you're when you're coming from when they know that hey this person's a professor at a b c or d college and uh you know maybe maybe three or four people in their entire family has ever graduated from college because of lacking the means for individuals to go to college because of costs of college in this country uh there's resentment built in there that's 
I mean, that again comes to you. We got to like, and myself am guilty of this too, because I'm white male. So I do have a certain amount of privilege that, you know, my brothers and sisters in the union might not come from. So I have to remember that when having these conversations that maybe my level of education is different from theirs. And I'm looking at them like, Hey, idiot, how come you don't understand this? It's right in front of your face when I should be realizing that I'm coming from a place of privilege. And that's why I have those thoughts. So I think a lot of it is the same sort of things that we're dealing with. Um, you know, just really recognizing uh, that we do have, uh, we are an imperial nation uh, coming to grips with that, coming to grips with the, 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 the costs of uh, living the American dream, you know, all that plays into everything that we're talking about with unions, uh, corruption. Uh, you know, we got a, a large hurdle to overcome and a lot of it has to do with our history. And that's where I really think academics can really play a huge role. Uh, I'm just not sure exactly how that plays out in, in terms of organizing and, 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 you know, making it real. That's yeah. I want to, Ad, I think um, you talked about the division between, you know, people who haven't come from privilege and people who have, but, and I also think that's uh, like the ruling class, like it's a ruling class strategy to sow that division. And at least in my own experience growing up in, in Wisconsin, my dad was a teacher. So, you know, we were fairly middle class. And then when they took that, when, Walker was taking the teacher's collective bargaining rights. I saw these working class Republican kids just kind of unknowingly backing Walker. And they were, you know, all these attacks about how the teachers were lazy. And, you know, I'd watch my dad work his butt off his whole life. He has a second job at Coca-Cola to put me and my family, or me and my brother and my sister through college. And then I'm hearing all these people call him lazy. And I started to build up resentment against anyone who was working class. You know, I thought they were uneducated and I thought they were just pawns. When, when really, when you allow yourself to, um, to build that contempt for working people, you're being a pawn yourself. You know, that's, that's exactly what they would like us to do, you know, to, to sow that rift in between, um, in between academics and the, in the blue collar working class there so yeah no i mean i, I definitely I, I agree with that because i've seen it from both sides you know I've, I've held that resentment against those in academia and then when i was going to school i kind of seen myself kind of being like well, won't these people just go get an education so i mean it works <laughs> both ways you know I've, I've been on both sides of it and it is it is definitely a hurdle uh, but I mean, you guys have been doing a great job with the labor club. A lot of the stuff that you guys have been doing, uh, you know, uh, you make a welcoming environment for folks to show up and be able to participate, even if they have some different views. Uh, so you guys have been doing a real good job of this. So there's definitely hope for old birds like me who are walking around a, uh, an industrial uh, uh, warehouse full of guys wearing Make America Great Again hats and stuff. So thanks, sure. thanks for thanks for keeping it going fellas <laughs> we appreciate We're that that's uh that, that means a lot to us that's i think uh i think that that was just totally the the, the point of the labor club because we are surrounded by a bunch of kids in a private institution who look down upon people who work so um uh it was it was in part to, to spread ideas of socialism but also to to spread ideas that in work there's there's dignity it's um, it's something that's dignified and that is it's the source of our economy and everything we do have um, everything that we have we have to thank labor for so um, yeah and I think a good point that you made like doing it is so important like I part of what helped break down the stereotypes for me was I went and I worked concrete for a summer and I was like yep. these are the hardest working dudes in the world and their lives yep. absolutely suck and their boss is so rich and, and he doesn't work at all and and they weren't dumb like I had thought they would be especially the ones who were illegal immigrants there because you know it was the only job they could get was this kind of crappy concrete place they were super intelligent and fun to talk to um, and like doing that work gives you the respect and there's no way to even understand how tough that lifestyle is until you've done it like i've wrestled my whole life and working concrete was harder than anything i've ever done by far 
the the last job I had at John Deere before I got laid off was uh, a pretty pretty laid back job, but the job one over from me was a pretty difficult job. And the dude that did it ran around all day like it was nothing, you know. And I kept looking like, man, I couldn't even do that job. And this dude, like, runs through it. Well, that dude ends up one day when I'm joking about, like, man, you move fast or whatever. He tapped his wrench on his leg and pulled his pants up. Dude had a titanium leg on one leg. So here I am, like, man, I don't even know if I could do that job. And this dude was running circles around that job with one leg. So, I mean, there's guys with, you know, missing fingers out there, you know, doing welding jobs and shit. And you look at them like, how does that guy even hold the thing? Like, you know, so people make a lot of sacrifices for, you know, just just to be able to send their kid to school and shit like that. And it go, it gets overlooked quite a bit in this, in this country, you know. Some, something I feel like uh, if we lived in a different country, you know, we'd, we'd be – having a little more a little bit more respect and maybe that's all that's missing in this country is like teaching people like the, the proper respect that's due to anybody that that puts their life on the line to make anything better definitely Absolutely. yeah and i love how like celebrities uh um one fun quote from celebrities is treat the uh, treat the janitor how you treat the ceo it's like you know you don't fucking do that no you should 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 treat the janitor better than the ceo the ceo is fine he's fine (laughs) he's it's fine absolutely um is are there any uh uh, closing remarks that you would like to to say louis or eddie um i mean i'll i'll say that um you know the there is a lot of doom and gloom right now with this, the uh, whole we're, we're becoming a fascist state and all this crap. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks are, are getting information from people that are making it seem like this just started happening three years ago. And I think, uh, you know, you guys and the work that you're doing uh, should feel really proud that you're kind of shining a light on that this is, isn't a problem that started three years ago. Uh, it started a lot longer than that. And the only thing that's ever really beat it back has been labor. Uh, whether it's, you know, the UAW participating in the civil rights uh, movement, you know, and being there in solidarity. Um, you know, all the way through. So, uh, you know, la- labor is a big deal, and I'm glad you guys are continuing to work on this uh, because it is going to be uh, the the biggest tool in the toolbox uh, when it comes to beating back fascism and everything that we're faced with uh, right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming on, Louis. We really appreciate it. Um, and. Uh, and yeah, go labor and and uh, well yeah, I'm gonna stop the recording now. We could probably stay on and chat if you want.